So first of all, thank you very much for all, uh, for, for, to all of you for coming to my talk, although it's in the lunch break. I hope uh, I can make it as interesting, interesting as possi possible for you. To tell you a bit about myself, um, my name is Florian. I graduated from ETH in 2014. I'm a software engineer at Terralytics. We are a little big data startup here in Zurich. Um, I've been working with big data technologies in the, in the last, uh, since the last six years. And to tell you a bit about the data that Terralytics is working with, we're working with uh, telecommunications data. So the data that everybody of you generates every day. Every time you make a call, every time you get an SMS, every time you travel around uh, through Switzerland, through any other country, you're generating events within the tele telecommunication networks. And these events we receive from the telecommunication provider and try to analyze them further. So as this uh, data is pretty sensitive, of course we don't get this data just uh, with a phone number or with a name, but we get it, of course, anonymized uh, in a way that you cannot track a user, for example, longer than 24 hours. So what we're getting in the events is, we're getting a, a user, we're getting a timestamp, and we're getting a base station ID. So, can you see this? Okay. So a uh, mobile network is based on multiple um, base stations, and every base station has an ID. So we're getting basically two sources uh, of, of data in uh, Terralytics. One is the events, and the other ones are the so-called cell repositories, which link to real-world locations. So we get an ID, and this ID leads to a location, for example, the antenna is on the roof of the cinema complex, or, for example, at Hauptbahnhof. The business model of Terralytics is, as we are not a big telco like Swisscom or so, uh, but a little startup, we're working with multiple providers in several different countries, like Germany, US, Singapore, Hong Kong, and try to scale our business model in that direction that we can just go take the data from one provider as it's similar data. Everywhere, everywhere uh, people make phone calls, people get SMS and so on. The data is really similar from country to country. So we get this different data. We have to unify it in the unified data model. And then we can run some um, algorithms on it. We can um, estimate the location better. We can try to find out what's the mode of transport that you're using. We can try to uh, run a flight detector. Was this person flying? For example, how did all of you come to this uh, location for uh, this morning? Did you take the tram or did you take the, um, the train? And of course, we have an infrastructure for every, for every provider. The data is so sensitive that it cannot leave the um, premises of the providers. So we have to maintain this whole infrastructure for every provider in every country that we want to run our programs in. So, of course, the question is now, uh, what, what, what do we do here? We have to do some kind of task automation because it's just not scalable that we have to do ingestion and we have to run statistic applications. We have to run uh, location estimation in every cluster um, for uh, uh, every day. And the data gets in sometimes every day, sometimes every five days and so on. So as this doesn't scale and we require it almost one employee to serve all the clusters and all the providers checking for new data, we said, um, and the problem is, okay, did Florian already run program P in cluster Z? What happens when Florian is sick? Who takes over this, his job? And also the big dis disadvantages are that you have human error. Did you configure your program, uh, your run correctly? Did you take the uh, correct version? All these are the questions that we want to solve with the task automation. And of course, uh, we're developers and we're lazy and we don't want to do manual repetitive tasks all the time. So what should our task automation do? Normally we receive the data in a landing zone somewhere in an um, FTP server for by SCP and so on. So we want to transfer this data to an HDFS, which is a distributed file system um, which is, has, uh, is highly, avail highly available and has rep uh, replication built in. Then, once we have this data in the HDFS, it's safe to be is, uh, safe in a distributed environment, so we can run the jobs in a distributed way. We can run ingestion of events um, in a distributed way because we receive multiple gigabytes, terabytes per day. We want to run statistic applications every day. Is the data correct? Did the provider deliver us, uh, uh, deliver us the correct data? Or is it somehow uh, fraudulent, or is it not available at all? 
We want to run the other jobs like uh, location estimation, uh, mode of transport detection, all these kind of jobs. And of course, as we're working in a distributed environment with hundreds of uh, servers, we ha it has to be fault tolerant. The server might easily crash and we don't want our job, to, uh, our whole automation program to fail just because of this reason. So we came up with a program and we call it Terra Scout. The basis of this is also what the first part of my uh, talk description is, um, the event-driven task automation. So we separate two concepts. We have a patrol, which is basically the event generator, and we have a handler, which is the uh, event consumer. So a patrol, in our example, for, um, continuously uh, checks for new paths in a, on, in a directory. So whenever a new path, um, like for example, whenever a new file pops up, we can say, okay, this is an event. Uh, we have to, we can give it to the handler. So the first question is, uh, which the patrol asks to the handler, do you accept this event? Can you work with this event? Is it the correct, has it the correct uh, file name or file format? Or maybe we, all, maybe we only want to work with files and not with uh, folders. So we can actually um, directly ignore the folders. The next question is, are you ready to actually handle the event? Maybe you ha we have to wait for some other files to come in. Maybe, maybe we're waiting like, every time uh, we receive an, a, file, a file, we have to wait for the next file as well. Or maybe the file is still in transition and we have to wait until it's stable on HDFS. Maybe we're still writing to the file and we want, we want the uh, handler only to handle and start, uh, start an action once the file is stable. So then the next the question, uh, thing is once we're ready to handle, we say, okay, please, handler, handle the task, run, an, uh, run a job, maybe uh, try to copy the file to HDFS, etc. In order to achieve that, TerraScout leverages Mesos. I'm not sure how many people of you know Mesos? Okay, a couple. Um, so Mesos describes itself as a distributed systems kernel. What you can think of, it's an, uh, it's an yeah, it's an abstraction of all your distri distributed environment. You have several nodes, and the nodes have a certain amount of cores, a certain amount of RAM, and these nodes then can register with, uh, with Mesos and say, I have this much RAM, and so, et cetera. It's fault tolerant. It has a, uh, a two-level scheduling mechanism. I will tell you a bit more about this later. It have, has native support for containers. So, for exa example, in Terralytics, we are also running Jenkins and Artifactory and all our development tools in there. It has uh, resource isolation using C groups, and a nice, another nice feature is it has uh, resource reservation using roles, so you can separate your cluster virtually into, for example, a production and a staging environment. So to talk a bit about the Mesos architecture, we have here, we have the Mesos masters. We have multiple masters because it has to be fault tolerant. Normally we have uh, about, two, uh, about uh, three masters. The leader election is handled by Zookeeper. And on the uh, right side here, we can see these are our slaves. So these are, might be our 100 machines that we have that, uh, that we put in our cluster. Then the other notion is actually a framework. A framework you can think of, it's just a program that you want to run, a distributed program. So the program A, it might have a task on slave one. It might also have another task on slave B, et cetera. So how the two level scheduling uh, works, the uh, slaves, register, uh, send an offer to the Mesos master. They say, okay, I'm slave one, I have two cores and 10 CP, uh, uh, t two cores and 10 gigabytes of memory, just to make it simple. Then Mesos goes and says, uh, says okay, framework A, can you work with this? We could, you can start any task you want with it. And this is where the second level of scheduling comes in because your application can itself decide what, which uh, resources should I accept. So the uh, framework A, let's say, it accepts uh, one core and two gigabytes of memory because it just wants to run, uh, run a little Java application. Then the rest of the resources goes back to the master, and the master can offer the, the other resources to framework B. Okay. So how to implement, actually, your own Mesos scheduler? Me Mes Mesos actually makes it quite easy. There's a Maven artifact that you can download, and it has a Java interface, uh, which has a couple of methods that you can um, implement, register it, uh, you get the message when you register it with a uh, Mesos master the first time, you have a 
re-registered when you actually had a master change, the resource offers are coming in, as you can see here, as a list of offers. Then you have a status update that are sent uh, when you s whenever your task receives an, uh, a status update. An um, important part is also the uh, scheduler driver here. The scheduler driver is basically the um, object with which you can communicate communicate back to the Mesos master. To describe more about the um, Terascout components, because I'm going to show you a di um, diagram la uh, later in a minute, um, we have the Terra uh, Mesos scheduler, which, which is the Mesos scheduler, the implementation of what you what are the interface that I just showed you. Uh, it schedules tasks in uh, Terra Scout. Right now, it's just really a first come, first serve queue, um, which takes tasks and can just spawn them in the uh, Mesos. Then we have a Mesos task, which is our abstract uh, abstraction of a task uh, that you can run within Mesos. So. This is the diagram so far. We have a Mesos master up here, and all of the other components that you, that you have here are actually the components that are running in Terra Scout. We have the handler that I showed you earlier. This is actually, okay, when you have to handle the method, you accepted it, you have to, you're ready to handle it. I want to handle it now, okay, I want to create a task. I want to spawn a spark job, for example. So the handler creates a Mesos task instance. This Mesos task instance then gets submitted to the scheduler. The scheduler always receives offer, uh, resource offers from the Mesos master. The Mesos master, um, the, the term, uh, Mesos scheduler then groups these uh, resource offers per slave because every slave um, might, send, uh, might send multiple offers because Mesos kind of cuts the offers down into little, little offers. So what the Terra Mesos scheduler does for you, it groups it, uh, it groups it already, it merges the offers. So you know, okay, for this slave in total, I could get these and these many resources if I combine all the resources of this slave. So the first thing is what the Terra Mesos scheduler calls the Mesos task, do you accept these resources? Can you work with the two, two, uh, two cores and the 10 gigabytes of RAM? If the Terra Mesos, Mesos task can work with it, it can try to launch a job. So in order to do this, the Terra Mesos scheduler asks the Mesos task, please give me your task description. Give me your launch, co launch command that should be executed on the execu executor and give me all the URIs that you might to download in your, uh, to your executor in order that you need for execution. For example, some, some jars. The next thing is the term Mesos scheduler sends the task to the Mesos scheduler, which then forwards it to the Mesos master. This is the creation of the task. So what happens wi when we receive some updates? The Mesos master Sends an, uh, sends an update to the Terra Mesos scheduler, it receives it through the interface that I showed before. Then this actually gets forwarded in the callback method that every Mesos task can implement. So the Mesos task gets an update, okay, this is just a normal update, your app is now in the state running. It's not staging anymore, it's not, not starting, it's really running, for example. And then another thing that we might receive is a task update, which means, okay, your task is finished. It might be your task, task got killed, it really finished, or it finished with an error. We have another uh, method for the uh, callback method for this, if you want to have some tidying up to do with your task, or something else, that's it, yeah. Then, of course, because all the, the jobs that we are running are mostly Java and Spark jobs, we can make some abstractions on top of it. Because the Mesos task, you have to always say, okay, um, this is what the task that you want to create, but can I, can, can, so can I somehow abstract these tasks further? So we have a Mesos JVM task, which is um, calling an application using the Java command, and we have a Spark, uh, Mesos Spark task, which is calling the application using Spark submit ta tasks. And the uh, goal of this is actually to just be able to define an application via configuration, which I will show you in a second. So the Mesos JVM task, what should it do? It should abstract the, JV, abstract the JVM task started with Java. It should know how to accept resources. It should know how to create a launch command. It should upload local files that you might have on your local system or just generated by TerraScout onto HDFS so they are reachable by any other node on which the job might be spawned. So it might be that on slave 92, now this job will be, will be spawned. And after the job, it should automatically tidy up all the files that you uploaded to the temporary folder. So this is an example of a configuration. We have a 
JVM, um, JVM. We have an app, uh, app, uh, app executable. We have a main class. We have driver cores that we want to register. This is a multi-thread application, so we might need more than one task. We have driver memory. We have XMX, XMS, the normal um, parameters that you know. We have, might have some extra class paths, application arguments, and system properties that we want to set. So this uh, configuration gets then parsed and gets generated into this command. As you see, it's a normal start command for Java. You have your application here, you have, um, uh, the, all the memory that you want to use, um, system um, properties, and we have one TerraScout UUID that we generate all the time. For each Mesos task instance, we generate this ID so you can later identify it when you want to use it for logging or other purposes that you might um, find there. Uh, main class and the parameter. So what is, what's for the Spark task? As you can see, it's very, very similar to the Java task, except that it should start with a Spark submit to it, um, um, launch command. It accepts, uh, knows how to accept resources, launch command, et cetera. Also the temporary folder gets created, same as for Java. So this looks a bit different because we have a distributed job that we want to start. We have the jar as well, but we also have driver memory and executor memory. So if, if Spark launches an application, multiple executor, executor, uh, executors get spawned as well. And how much memory do you want to give them? How many cores do you want to use in total? Here we use 500 cores. We, can, we have some, do you see this? We have some uh, configuration properties that we can set for Spark as well. And this is actually the command that gets created then afterwards. So we have the Spark submit command, we have the Mesos master that we know anyways because it's a Mesos framework that we uh, start the stuff from. Um, we have the executor memory, total number of cores. We have with dash dash conf, we have the um, Spark parameters that we want to set. And also we have in our driver and in our executors as well, we can access this TerraScout ID. So what other features do we have in TerraScout? Um, because we have, uh, in Terralis, we have a notion of um, uh, staging and production. We actually want to run this, uh, these tasks in a specific Mesos role. So we can do this. We have reconciliation of Mesos tasks to check, okay, um, is the job still running and so on. We're still uh, um, always um, updating our scheduler um, while, we, while we're running. We want to start the task only in a specific um, time of the day so that our data scientists can use a cluster while uh, during the day and during the night. TerraScout then takes over the resources and can spawn the jobs that it needs to run um, until the next day. It can deal with Mesos master changes. It has a REST API to query status and version and trigger a shutdown remotely. And uh, TerraScout is pushing metrics into a time series database so all the jobs that are um, started and so on. We push push the number of jobs and number of handlers that got executed into InfluxDB in our example. Um, that's it so far for me. Thank you very much for your time and and good afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody has a question? I guess then thank you very much and